Perfect. And uh, I'll pass it off to Laura Devlin. She's going to provide an update on employment issues. And then Kristen McCarthy Bay, he, she's going to provide a quick update on the state response and reopening plans. And lastly, and most importantly, we're going to spend most of our time with Lee Hoffman. He's an energy expert that is often called upon by policymakers across the state for his insight on issues like rate design, grid reliability, utility, and clean energy issues. So we're really lucky to have him. I think he's going to be a, a great person to kind of, for all of us to learn from. It, it's no nonsense. And I think he's a uh, really just kind of straightforward guy that I think is called upon by many people on both sides of the aisle. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to you, Tony, to, to lead us off. Thanks, Brian. Um, and thank you very much for kind of coordinating this. It is on the top of people's minds and uh, the, the power restoration and uh, the storm that hit us. Uh, it has been a remarkable turn of uh, events. It, it's literally just a week, two weeks almost. That being said, there's been a tremendous push to have greater accountability. And um, this is an opportunity for us to be able to get some more information to people. Um, I'm thrilled that we have Lee Hoffman here uh, to be able to offer some of the nuances. And I have to tell you, before this meeting, I went and looked at my UI bill and it is so confusing and, and the cost is very hard to understand and, and invariably it keeps creeping up. Uh, so I, I think having Lee is an important benefit. That being said, uh, I. I want to share that we have taken action as a legislative body. Uh, in a bipartisan basis, I know on Monday, uh, the Public Utilities Review Authority will have a docket hearing uh, in evaluating Eversource, but it'll be symptomatic of looking at all the utilities. One, regards to their rate increase request that has been uh, on the docket before, but also I think as a result of the public's input, and demand, as well as legislative demand, we are going to evaluate how they have responded to the storm. I'll simply leave you my impressions of this. Uh, being able to drive around, because we were without power for nearly uh, eight days, the fact is, in driving around and talking to so many people, there was an incredible sense of frustration and a lack of responsiveness from our utilities. Um, and I hope that uh, as we investigate and create solutions moving forward, uh, that, that we are able to be much more prepared for potential future storms. But that being said, I have to tell you, it really grates me when I hear the ever sources of the world tell the world that they were prepared for this storm and that they did a tremendous job. I, I have to honestly say that uh, in what world were they in to claim that they did a good job? Uh, so you know, a little humility, a little responsiveness is something that I think that people are clamoring for and now demanding. And this meeting will be an opportunity for us to hear more of those concerns. But that being said, we want to have people, and I think we all agree in, in a legislative um, a delegation for Fairfield, we want you to submit input to uh, the Pura docket. And I know on August 27th, there will be an Energy and Technology Committee forum which will have the uh, CEO of Eversource appearing before them to give some answers. So it, it's, if there's anything else I can offer in this initial introduction is that we want to voice the frustration and, and the disappointment and, and the public health and safety concerns of not having power restored on a timely basis. And I noticed that um, we have a representative from Optimum that's participating in this forum. We're listening in. Um, we also want to hold accountability for all of our other utilities, Optimum, Frontier, AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon. It, it's part of the public utility and the public trust, and they all have to do a far better job. So Brian, I really appreciate you putting this meeting together to let people have an opportunity do need to share their viewpoints, but more importantly, for us to hear them and be their voice up in Hartford and within the public utility realm. Thanks, Tony. And um, just to follow on that, I'm going to talk real quickly with Brenda being out. Um, I have spoken to her office before this meeting, um, just to go through some of the things that we've um, been discussing. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, we all know internet services have taken on so much more importance with all of our lives, whether it's 
we're working from home or educating our ch children from home, either full time or part time. Um, you know, internet service is now more important than ever, and the status quo just has not been working. Um, so one of the things we're working with Brenda's office, we all have to really, you know, push these internet service providers. I have to admit, Optimum in particular, uh, to do a much better job. You know, we created a townwide poll to publicly demonstrate, you know, what we already knew, but their bad performance, because we wanted to basically publish it and, and, quite frankly, try to embarrass them a little bit because they weren't being responsive to us and they weren't being responsive to their customers. So we felt like we had no other choice. Um, Lee will kind of talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the legislative options and regulatory scheme and we're going to try to do as much as we can to kind of push in this area i am glad that their lobbyist is on she has been very helpful and responsive um but the, the big concern from my perspective is just the lack of putting financial resources in the infrastructure uh to get our internet in town to work uh properly um you know there is an issue that we have where we can really have our thumb on the utility companies in a way that we can't uh, on the internet providers, but we do think we have options for that. We also think um, we're going to look to try to get new additional internet providers into the town to create greater uh, competition. And uh, we'll have a lot more to say on this topic, so I'm going to just stop there. Um, second, uh, for a federal update, uh, there's some good news and bad news as it relates to stimulus checks. Uh, the good news is both political parties uh, want the coronavirus uh, stimulus package to have uh, a direct payment to people. Uh, the bad news is they just can't figure out what that amount is. Um, if you talk between the top Democrats in the White House, they broke down because they could not come to a compromise on how much to spend. Uh, Democrats, I think, are proposing $3 trillion, while Republicans have a target of about a $1 trillion. Personally, I'm struggling with this whole issue because, you know, as the size of our national deficit keeps growing, I'm perplexed and troubled. Uh, between this disconnect we have with the stock market that has seemed to completely rebounded to new highs while Main Street and unemployment levels remain uh, really high. So um, clearly, you know, there's a disconnect that we need to work with to, to get our economy working because what's working on Wall Street is not working on Main Street. Um, and then on an unrelated topic, just quickly, uh, I'm also working with regional athletic departments and schools in an effort to open full use in high school sports safely. Um, we believe organized sports are important for youth physical and emotional development. Um, and if they're not in organized sports, they will likely be cohorting in unsupervised environments. And this could be worse on a myriad of levels. Um, and it's an equity issue also because, you know, if we don't have youth and high school sports done through the towns, a lot of those children are just going to move to private clubs. And those families that don't have the resources are going to be left out to the child's detriment. So that is something uh, we want to address. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Laura Devon. Great. Thanks, Brian. I'd just like to really welcome everybody here. Uh, certainly, it's a big audience for a topic near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, you know, during this past storm, despite the fact, and we're in UI country, right? So Fairfield and certainly Trumbull and some other very few surrounding towns rely on United Illuminating. And despite the fact that they had categorized this storm as a level three, which would require five to seven days for restoration, we were restored within five to seven days, but still I find that unacceptable. Like how, we've got to be able to advance that and the total lack of information for uh, their customers, both from an electric and from an internet provider perspective, uh, was really horrendous. And it doesn't enable people to be able to set expectations to know, you know, what to anticipate. Um, it was great that Altice made some of their free hotspots available. I found a, a little bridge in Southport that I could work out of my car for a while, and I know everybody had incredible frustration. So I'm anxious to hear about Lee to uh, Senator Wong, I'll tell you, I did just submit my UI bill, and I think we'll have more conversations about this to get a layman's language of what all those elements are, why sometimes we're charged, sometimes we're not, and why there's such a huge increase just even over uh, not only the past months, but the past year. Um, and then lastly, maybe our staff could put together kind of a one page image that we could all make available on our social media that outlines all the upcoming hearings, because there are several. And the one that was mentioned related to Eversource, I believe is going to be broadcast on CTN, 
Um, there's also ways to be able to submit testimony. So maybe we could make it easy and just outline the upcoming hearing so people can kind of track those because um, there is another UI specific hearing, et cetera. But all that said, my topic briefly is an unemployment uh, claims update. Um, so just real quick, uh, you know, the, the regular unemployment for people who lost their jobs or lost their unemployment by, you know, no uh, cause of their own, we have, the state has uh, processed or received 700, over 710,000 claims so far and has paid out a little over $3 billion. Um, there's also the PUA, and the PUA is for the gig workers, if you will. One thing for people to note, because I am still getting inquiries and our other legislators may be also, if you qualify for even $1 of regular unemployment insurance, so that might mean you have a part-time job where you get a W-2, but you also, maybe the majority of your income is through 1099s. Uh, the way that the programs are structured, those 1099s aren't factored in. If you receive even $1 of uh, pay that's reflected on a W-2, um, then you're not eligible for the PUA. Um, but the federal pandemic unemployment compensation for the extra $600 uh, there were about 18,000 claims, about $150 um, million dollars paid out on that. And sorry, I gave you those wrong numbers. We've issued about $2.5 billion on that program. And that expired at the end of July. So uh, the president is apparently is redirecting federal funds at $300 a week and states can add an extra $100 a week. The state of Connecticut does intend to do that, and the application deadline for the state is September 10th, so there will be more coming up on that. Um, despite the agencies staffing up and creating a new you know, customer care center, if you will, um, we continue to hear uh, concerns about lack of responsiveness, unable to reach a human, um, and it does still take potentially up to two weeks to be able to get an answer, even from our offices. But if you are struggling at all or know someone who is, please contact any of us. If uh, Brian or Kristen is your rep or through Senator Wong, what we do just ask is that, you know, we don't double up on the claims because that actually slows things down. So in th those cases, either the Senate office will take it or the House offices will take it. Um, but we're here to help you. So I hope that is some helpful information. And I just encourage you to reach out if you're struggling in any way. Sure. Thanks, Laura. And uh, we'll pass it over to you, Kristen, to give a, a quick update on the state reopening plan. Thanks so much, Brian, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, I know we all want to talk about energy, but really quickly, a big conversation that's happening here in Fairfield around the state and all over the nation right now is about what's happening with school, childcare, full-time back, hybrid plans, full-time distance learning. That's such a big part of, of the reopening right now. And with that, I think we just would emphasize that a lot of those decisions, um, we, we're hearing about that as legislators, I'm sure my colleagues are as well. Uh, our central office and our board of ed has done an amazing job in terms of looking at what's possible and working in concert with organizations like Wakeman and the Y. And lots of suggestions coming in from folks about how do we really adequately address and help make sure that families have the supports we, they need, we need. Um, and I think that it begs some broader federal level conversations, which uh, I'll then quickly switch to the topic of today which is um, energy. And I, I won't speak long just because I know I wanna hear from Lee and I wanna hear the conversation, but the storm that happened, um, the, there's no doubt we've gotta look at how we are responding, how we are commute, hearing from our utilities. We've gotta hold folks accountable. Take back your, the GRID Act is one that the Energy Committee co-chairs and the ranking members um, are putting forward and looking at the possibility of legislation some of which might occur in a special September session if that happens, and then going forward, 
um, in the next session to really have accountability for our utilities as much as we're able. And I think that's important for people to know both for electricity, and I'm sure Lee's going to talk more about this, but also with cable and internet service. There's, uh, there are limits on what the state government can do. I spent about an hour on the phone with someone from Pura, specifically around some of the cable issues um, when we had that, uh, the survey that uh, the first select woman put out, and really heard a lot about the, um, the FCC and its role, and really that there are things we can do within, but some of that happens at the federal level. So I think, too, this storm speaks to me about the importance of looking at the root causes of climate change, of the importance of things like creating microgrids, which I'm going to give a shout out to Scott Thompson and our town administration and others who are so amazing and forward looking with DEEP to, to do that for our emergency communication system here in town, looking at renewable energy, um, and looking at what we can do together as a community. I also will just say, this storm season is predicted to be one of the worst in years. And we are going to have to hold our utilities accountable. We are going to have to look at moving to renewables. But we are also going to have to be prepared for potentially some other additional bad storms as we go forward. So I just continue to urge people to go to websites like ready.gov, have your first aid, your water, your food, be prepared um, for what is likely to be another difficult um, storm season ahead. I know there are a couple of hurricanes lining up right now. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Ryan, and thank you for gathering us together. Thanks so much. And uh, I'll pass over to the man of the hour. I, I sadly must admit that the best energy attorney in the state of Connecticut, uh, but uh, Lee Hoffman, very lucky to have you, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Gotta unmute him. Oh, all right, Lee, I'll unmute you. Let's see, where'd you find you in here? Dun, dun, dun. This is our new world of Zoom life, right? I'm just waiting for the kids to come inside as I'm looking for Lee's, uh, I think these are the alphabetized. Well, there you are. I found you. Unmute you. It's actually, I'm, uh, it took me so long to find him because of the uh, amount of participants, which is great. I'm glad we have so many people uh, participating. It's an important topic. So, Lee, now I will turn it back over to you. And you, sir, have the power to do what everybody wants to do, which is muzzle a lawyer. So, watch <laughs> so um, I, I, I find myself somewhat surprised that everybody finds this exciting. Usually, when I tell my family, about what I do, they immediately go to sleep. So I'm, I'm grateful for the, for the audience. And I do want to take only a few minutes to go through some very basic stuff about how we do utility regulatory stuff in Connecticut so that you can understand what the agencies can and can't do, what the legislature can do to change things, and also what you as the public can do to insert yourself into the process. I know that um, Representative Devlin mentioned that, and, and I'll get to that towards the end as well. But understand that our primary regulatory body is the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, which is a body of limited jurisdiction. They only really regulate utilities. So they regulate electricity, natural gas, water, that sort of thing. They have a very light touch on cable and internet and, that, and those sorts of things. But since we've gone from the traditional um, phone company model years and years ago to what we have now, much more of that is regulated on the federal level under the Federal Communications Act, and our Pura has far less of a touch with those companies than they do with the other utilities. Um, when I say that they regulate utilities, what I'm talking about is they actually act as a tribunal. There are three, three commissioners to the PURA, and they act as adjudicators. There are witness stands, there's a dais, they're up on it, they have a gavel. They're like judges in a lot of ways. So traditionally, they don't affirmatively regulate the way that a regulatory agency like DEEP or the Department of Public Health might regulate. They more sit back and wait for people to come into them and act as an adjudicative body. That's changed, and I'll get to that, but, but that's part of that may be part of why we have some systemic issues that we have. And in fact, the last commissioner of the Department of Public Utility Control 
which changed into the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority under Governor Malloy. The last chair of the DPUC was a, was a gentleman named Kevin Delgabo. He was appointed there by Governor Rell and, and eventually uh, became the head of the DPUC. And he was a real forward thinker. In 2009 and 2010, he barnstormed around the state and said, what do you want the DPUC to do? Because I can focus on rates and I can make things cheaper. Because right now, Connecticut's number two in electricity prices behind only Hawaii. And that's still the case, by the way. We're still number two and not in a good way. Um, I can, if you'd rather, I can focus on clean energy and we can get and we can get our resources greener, get rid of coal. Or I can focus on reliability and we can have fewer problems when we have storm outages. At the time, it was really focused on storm and uh, on ice, but that sort of thing. But he said, I can maybe focus on two of those. But if I make the resources greener, they may not be as reliable. They may not be as cheap. If I focus on cheap, I'm going to have to go with coal. And so it may not be as clean. So you have to pick and choose what you want me to do. And he asked that of the governor's office and of the legislature and everything else. Real forward thinker. And then Dan Esty took over as commissioner of DEEP. We added the E for energy. And Commissioner Esty took a very different approach, which was we could be cleaner, cheaper, and more reliable, all three. And frankly, I see it more on the trade-off that, that Chairman Delgado saw than I did Commissioner Esty, because I do think that if you make things cleaner, you can make them more expensive. And with intermittency, you have reliability problems. If you make things reliable, you've got to pay for it. And so that's kind of where we find ourselves now. The other thing to bear in mind through all of this is that the utilities are regulated because they're monopolies and because they're taking ratepayer funds. My electric bill, your electric bill, your gas bill, all of that. The utilities are regulated because they get a guaranteed rate of return from the ratepayers. But the utilities really have two pools of money. They have what are ratepayer funds, which are things that they can recover for from ratepayers, but they also have shareholder funds that are profits and those sorts of things. And so certain expenses are allowed to come from the ratepayers. Other expenses are allowed to only come from the shareholders. So two big examples are if you've ever listened to um, utility advertising, they'll always say at the end, like a political ad, this was paid for by Eversource shareholders, or this was paid for by a surcharge uh, on your electric bill or what, wherever the source is, but they always have to identify where that's coming from. Where that also gets important is on executive bonuses, because executive bonuses for regulated utilities are tied directly to customer service performance as one metric um, for, them to, for them to be ratepayer funds. For them to be, the, the shareholders can pay whatever they want for bonuses, but the allowable ratepayer funds, there's, there, it's a sliding scale and it very complicated, don't want to get into the detail, but just be aware that customer service is a metric on which executive bonuses are based. Um, so you should be aware of that. We now have a new sheriff in town. She's actually been here for over a year um, running the PURA. Her name is Marissa Gillette. She came to us from Maryland. One of the interesting things that she just did two or three months ago was she established a permanent prosecutorial unit. So it's a separate industry of Pura that doesn't talk to the rest of Pura that is allowed to go out and find problems. And that's, a, that's within her powers to do, and I think it's a creative use. And we're seeing that she's taking a more proactive approach than we've seen in the, in the past. Um, and we'll get, to that, we'll get to that in a minute as to what that means, and it's already been touched on by some of the prior speakers. I would also be remiss if I didn't say that with respect to this storm response, we've been here before. When we got hit with, uh, 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 yeah, it was Tropical Storm Irene and Winter Storm Alfred, right, bang, bang, at the beginning of the Malloy administration, we, we came up with a bipartisan two-storm panel because we had two storms. And that panel came up with, reviewed what the utilities did, what the state response was, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and came up with a series of recommendations. Full disclosure, if you don't like what the two-storm panel did, you can blame me because I was on it. 
Um, so I'm one of the guys who was there. But what, what the two-storm panel came out with was an 80-page report that suggested that the utility infrastructure had to be hardened. There had to be tree removal done. Um, we decided against undergrounding at that time because the utilities convinced us that it would be uh, more expensive than it might be worth from a reliability standpoint. But I think maybe in this day and age, it's time to revisit that as technology has improved. We also demanded better community liaison relationships uh, between the utilities and the communities that they serve. And we also, that's where microgrids came out, was the idea for microgrids came out of that. And I'm thrilled to see that Fairfield and a few other communities were forward thinking enough to take advantage of those because those have been lifesavers for the communities that have them. And I know that Representative Vehi mentioned that and you know, my hat's off to you because that's a, that's a really smart move. If you remember about two years after the two storm panel and, and the two storms, we had Superstorm Sandy. And while that really affected the, the, the coast of Connecticut a great deal, it was a much bigger storm than those other two storms were prior to it. And if you look at Connecticut's response versus New York or New Jersey's response that was hit with that same storm, we fared much, much better because the community liaisons were in place. Everybody knew what they were doing. And we learned some lessons from the two storm panel and, and what we did afterwards. And that was actually a pretty decent response. And we didn't have the same hue and cry that we're having as a result of uh, Tropical Storm Isaesis. And I never thought I'd have to learn how to pronounce that word, but I've been saying it more than my own kids' names now. Um, since Sandy came through, however, the utilities have reduced the number of crews that they've got on their payrolls permanently. They've also, the liaison program has become mm, a little more uneven, let's, shall we say. So Senator Wickos up in Litchfield County is an Eversource employee, and the liaison there is really, really good because he's a state senator and an Eversource employee, and that liaison program is working out really well. Other communities are less well served. Um, you may have seen in the city of Bridgeport has been furious with United Illuminating for what happened there. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's uneven at best and, and probably needs to be fixed. So that's enough of the history lesson. What are we doing about it now? Um, Pura, in response to um, requests from the legislature, and I think it was Senator Huang who mentioned that it's been bipartisan right along, and that's exactly right. There was a bipartisan request from the legislature. There was also a request from the Attorney General's office for Pura to launch an investigation, and that's exactly what Pura did. And the, the docket number, and this is important for anybody who wants to get involved to know the docket number, is 20-08-03, uh, and it's called the Investigation into the Electric Distribution Companies, that's what we call our electric utilities, Electric Distribution Companies Preparation for and Response to Tropical Storm Isaesis. And what Pura is going to do is a full-blown, very thorough investigation. Anybody who wants to be a party to this docket can do so as long as they sign up by September 4th. The utilities are going to have to present all of their evidence as to what their storm response was to the agency by October 19th. The public will be allowed, the public is going to be given three days to comment. Um, it'll all be done by Zoom, but the agency is going to listen to three days of public comment at the end of October. And then we're going to have a week and a half of, and I say we because I'm involved in this docket, uh, we're going to have a week and a half of evidentiary hearings, and then we're going to have briefs and oral arguments and lawyers fighting with each other, and the agency is going to come up with a final decision by the end of April on exactly what that investigation yielded. Um, several communities have joined in um, and have asked for Pura to look at this and to also consider levying penalties against the utilities and whatever else have you, and I'm representing some of those municipalities, full disclosure. Uh, but that docket is, is, going to, um, is going to come about starting now and going all the way through till April. What is unprecedented, at least for me, is that Pura opened another docket called 200803 REO, standing for Reopener 1, which is Pura consideration of civil penalty enforcement action 
against the electric distribution companies after storm ECESIS investigation. Usually, you wait for the result of an investigation before you start talking about a civil penalty, but here Pura has already kind of tipped its hand a little bit. And what Pura has said is, if the investigation shows that there's a notice of violation, we're not gonna screw around. It, by the end of April, we'll, we'll have the investigation concluded. Any notice of violation we're gonna issue is gonna be issued on May 7th, so a week after the, the final decision. And then we will have hearings in June, and by July 14th, we'll have a final penalty determination. So I do find that interesting that the agency has already kind of tipped its hand as to um, what it's doing. Now, the two other things to mention before I shut up and we start taking questions. One is that Representative Devlin, I believe it was, mentioned listening to the peer hearings and that the next round of peer hearings are gonna be on CTN, which is certainly true. That relates to Eversource having raised the electric bill starting July 1, and whether or not that was appropriate. Pura has since hauled that back and said, no, you can't have that much money. And the hearing to figure out exactly what Eversource's rate increase ought to be starts on Monday. And you can see that one on CTN. Not everything is broadcast on CTN. However, if you need a cure for insomnia, any Pura proceeding is available on the internet live you go to ct.gov slash Pura, that's ct.gov slash P-U-R-A, three quarters down the page, there's a, there's a button that, under quick links that says listen to live proceedings, and then you can just click on it. It's audio only, um, although maybe now with Zoom, uh, to be honest with you, all the hearings I've been involved in with Pura, I, it's been Zoom, and so you may just go straight to the Zoom link, but you can absolutely do it that way. Um, Hey, can I just jump in to add, you, you mentioned the um, being a party to or getting involved. Pura then sends notifications to you, so you get up to date. Maybe you can just share a little bit about that for those who actually want to be in the loop that way. Are you looking at my notes, Representative Vahey? Because oh. that was next. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's okay. So, Representative Vahey is exactly correct. You can get involved in these dockets. You can file public comment. You can become a party. There is the, the then DPUC in the 1990s invested a ton of money on an electronic filing system that was built on Lotus Notes that was state of the art in 1993. It's the system we're still using. So I would recommend against trying to file using the electronic system because it's very archaic and very complex. However, Representative A is exactly correct. If you, if you become part of the proceeding, you will get all of the notices and everything will be pushed to you by email. The easier way for non-practitioners to do that is to email the executive secretary of the PURA directly. And I'm gonna give you his email address. His name is Jeff Gadiosi. And his email address is Jeff, J-E-F-F, dot Gaudiosi, G-A-U-D-I-O-S-I, -S -S that's J-E-F-F -F dot G-A-U-D-I-O-S-I -S -S at C-T dot gov. And that's his email address. And if you send him an email and say, you want to be in, involved as a party or you want to file a comment, because as a member of the public, you can do that. You can simply reference the docket number. As I said, that's important. You got to reference the docket number so he knows which docket you're talking about, and that is 20-08-03. You just send him that email, he will get you onto the service list and whatever else you want, um, and that's gonna be the easiest way to do that. Jeff will now kill me because after this, um, after this, this uh, presentation, he will be, I'm sure, inundated with emails, but he's already getting a fair number, so um, he'll have to do it. Lee, if I may. Yes, Lee, if I may, before you go on, I think it's important, and I speak for myself, and I hope for the entire delegation, for people that are listening, and also the people that may be looking at this recording. I, I think we will all include that detail and the docket number on our respective websites, and uh, we would encourage people to CC us when they send that material in. Uh, that docket and the hearing is up in New Britain, uh, I, I would offer that we could literally 
deliver that document to be sure that it is handed to the um, recording secretary as well. So we can double check. But I think one of the important things we can share with the public right now is the fact that if they want their voices to be heard, this is a way to be sure that they will have their day in court, so to speak. And I think the second issue, equally important, is the fact that, you know, Ms. Gillette has been a breath of fresh air. Yeah. And she has taken a very proactive position in regards to, you know, it's not business as usual. It's not the cozy mm -hmm. dynamics that it was. And, and I hope, I hope that as we kind of go through this process into next April, there are storms coming. We hope that this is a wake up call to our utilities to reevaluate immediately how they're proceeding. And I will offer the other thing is the liaison role. We have great liaison staff that were working very closely with us in Fairfield. And I also have district representing Eversource. But the problem was central command at those utilities weren't responding. So the liaison role that, that was so effective in past storms were very much watered down and virtually powerless to, to, to effectuate these changes. So, you know, the recommendations, I actually read your recommendations from the past panel. There were some very good ones, but they weren't follow through. And that's part of the frustration in saying they weren't prepared, they didn't do their job. And there is a day of reckoning and accountability that will come out of this. But I'm refreshed to, to reiterate to people listening that, you know, Ms. Gillette has, has put out notice in addressing through the second docket that you mentioned that this is not business as usual and you've got to do a far, far better job. Would that be fair to say, Lee? It, it absolutely would. And it's actually, um, I've said this to her face, so I don't have any problem um, saying it here, is the, the, the practice before the PURA and Representative Farnan has been in front of them before too, so he hopefully will agree with me that the practice before the PURA has largely been a good old boys network. And I do mean boys, because um, very few women uh, were practicing in front of that agency. And as one of the good old boys, I took full advantage of that. And she's actually using the rule book and has completely and totally overhauled the agency as much as anybody can in a year's time. And I find it refreshing. I find it works better. Um, and I also find that it's far easier to explain to people what the outcomes are going to be because the rules are being followed. I think she's fantastic. Um, one, one of the questions we got from the public, hint, hint, um, was about the fact that they were annoyed, like, yeah, yeah, we're going to have this meeting. It's going to be back to the same way. I do think there's a possibility with this new chairperson that we're not going to all just forget. The fact that there are three days of public comment, the fact that for something called community solar, which is going slow in the state, the fact that she just basically ripped the EDCs uh, on that with fines, which was very surprising to me, makes me think that she isn't fooling around, but we'll see. But let's, let's have you wrap up, Lee, then we'll go into the questions. I'll let you go, Lee. Only the, la the last thing that I want to talk about is the bipartisan Take Back Our Grid Act that the, that the legislature is proposing. Um, the ranking members and the, the co-chairs of the Energy Committee got together and came up with a proposal to fine utilities $100 a day for residential customers who have critical need when they lose power. Um, and $500 a day for residents for food and medicine if their power's out for more than two days. Pure would have, advanced, uh, have enhanced ability to issue fines and penalties and could prohibit using utilities from using broad disclaimers and tariffs. If you look at your electric bill or the tariff that's based on it, you know that right now you can't recover for lost food and, and lost other things. It's in, your, it's in your electric agreement. And then finally, uh, minimum staffing requirements on payroll so that we have better storm response and um, looking at burying power lines again. And that's a bill that's obviously gonna be taken up the next time the legislature convenes, which looks like it's gonna be in September. So, so Lee, we're gonna knock off one of our questions with that. Under that bill, does it, or, or based on what you know with Pura, how do you think people would get reimbursed for their losses if that were to get passed? Um, the way that people get reimbursed for anything from the utilities, you just run it as a credit on your electric bill. So if you get a $500 credit and you, your electric bill is 100 bucks a month, then for five months, you're not paying an electric bill. Yeah. That's how I would and imagine. I think the key, and, the, and the key thing there is we just need to make sure 
uh, the utilities have a practice of uh, getting uh, expenses recovered from the ratepayers. We'd have to obviously make sure that those are not recoverable costs and that they're not passing those back on uh, to other individuals. So that's something that we just need to make sure. That's a question for the policymakers, but that's you guys. Yep. Okay. Um, any, uh, anything else Lee, before we jump into questions? And Justin, I'm sure we're going to lean on you with these questions. Okay. So the first question that came in was, is Connecticut prepared to threaten Eversource and UI and put them on performance improvement plans or under monitorship until performance metrics are met? Lee, do we even have the ability to put them under a monitorship? I mean, I don't till performance yeah. metrics are met. I, I, yes, the answer is yes. The Public Utilities Authority has, Regulatory Authority has that um, ability under Section 1611 of the General Statutes for the method and manner of how the utilities provide safe and reliable service to their constituents. So the, what would have to happen is Peer would have to establish what those performance metrics are. Right now, um, the utilities, I'm sure, will, will, will be very quick to remind me that they have storm plans that have been approved by Pura and that they were acting on those storm plans. Um, the question becomes whether or not we need to beef up those response plans, which I think is appropriate. And then certainly um, Pura has signaled that it's willing to issue enforcement with fines, which would not be recoverable from the ratepayers. Uh, for failure to meet the metrics. They're already doing that now. So the answer, short answer is yes. Longer answer is they could beef them up too if they wanted to. Yeah. And a similar Sorry, question we got. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, can I throw in a question to Lee that it was a topic that wasn't really addressed and it might help address some of the questions that um, at least we saw earlier related to cable and internet. Yeah. And Lee, could you speak to sort of sort of the rules of the infrastructure so that it's not that another company can't come in per se, but that that infrastructure is currently owned in our case by Altais. Um, so unless someone was able to invest and build new infrastructure, and there may be other ways, but can you sort of just touch on that a little bit so people have an understanding of how sure. that works? You're, you're exactly right, Representative Devlin. So the catch is, is that we used to just have cable companies. And until, until shortly after the, the turn of the millennium, the cable companies would have franchise agreements for five years, 10 years, whatever, where they would have the exclusive territory for a particular town. As we shifted to DSL and fiber and everything else, Connecticut decided and the FCC decided as well that there's some limited competition that's available. So if somebody wanted to lay their own cable or their own fiber in your neighborhood, they could do so, but it's exceedingly cost prohibitive because you don't have any customers right away. Verizon was certainly trying to do that a while back with its Fios program, and that turned out to be a money loser, and it now focuses more on its wireless business a little bit. And frankly, 5G is gonna be a competitor to that as well, but we're not there yet. So the Public Utility Regulatory Authority, because those companies aren't public utilities, they don't get a guaranteed rate of return and they don't have the rates approved by the state regulators, there isn't a whole lot that the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority can do to regulate those entities. And Lee, so, may I follow up on that, Brian? Just because sure. I think this is, I think that you know, power, electric, um, water, is one that the internet is definitely something we've heard a lot about. And just to underscore that, you know, as I mentioned in my intro comments, just, I'm not an expert like you, but having had the conversation with the Pura attorney, it's really some of the FCC rulings that have happened that limit what we are able to do, either Pura or definitely us as state legislators as well. Is, can you comment on that? So, so now you're taking me back to constitutional law, but you have the issue of federal preemption. So there are certain things that the federal government has preempted, i.e. the ability to declare war and to have a standing army, state militias notwithstanding. Um, and one of the things that they have done through the Federal Communications Act is they have said that um, for, for the, 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 these 
communications providers that the federal government is going to regulate them and they're going to regulate them through the FCC. So for better or for worse, that removes the Puro's ability to regulate them as utilities and it puts that regulatory burden on the FCC. Um, I can't speak for that industry, but I would imagine that even if the legislature tried to do something to allow Pura to re-regulate them because cable franchises were regulated, as I said, a, a long time ago, but I would expect that even if the legislature were to try to regulate them in some way and change the rules, I would imagine that um, the, the industry lawyers would turn around and, and say that the Federal Communications Act prohibits that. And, and you'd have a constitutional argument. You may get to the Supreme Court that way though, so that'd be fun. So this goes along to another question we got was regarding what is Connecticut doing to encourage additional competition or uh, competition or performance in the state? Um, I know, for example, Go Net Speed is a company that's interested in moving into potentially into Fairfield, which would be great. It's internet only, very fast, not cable, but that's one potential option. Um, you know, we we just need to help them make a company like that make the business decision that the infrastructure would be worthwhile um as i don't know if there's that you know another issue was you know related to what are we doing to make these uh make these internet uh, service providers be uh able to respond to complaints quicker and we kind of already talked about that uh, the only thing i would add there are customer service laws on the books that do get at them um and those could potentially be strengthened. Uh, the question is, as you said, Lee, how far can those laws go before they are uh, seen in conflict with federal law and federal preemption? But um, I don't think an internet provider wants to be in a place that they're saying that customer service laws aren't applicable to them. That's probably not a good place for them to be. So um, I would be interested in making those laws stronger uh, to potentially push back on them. No, Brian, um, you're absolutely another, right, because it's not just a convenience thing anymore. It's an essential services, especially with back to school, with people working at home. Um, it's not a luxury item. It's a necessity. Well, yep, and that was a question. And, and I want to add yeah. on Brian's question, Lee, is, is there anything that the state legislature can do on a statutory basis of managing the expectations? Because I, I think people are remarkably patient and resilient in understanding that damages occur, but the, the lack of response, the insensitive uh, responses and, and the lack of managing expectations uh, from customer service is builds that frustration. And being the only game in town, people literally have to just take it and wait. So Lee, in your professional opinion, I know there's a federal component to this, but for us as a legislature, how can we be a voice for the people and saying, your customer service is non-existent, literally a brick wall. What can we put pressure on you as a utility to respond? And I have to tell you, I, I know this is a Fairfield delegation. I still have people with optimum outages in Easton. This is absolutely unacceptable. Communications and, and accountability has to be there and it has to be much better response. Is there anything we can do statutorily, Lee? Well, the, the flippant response that I would have for you, Senator, is aren't you a Republican and what are you doing calling for more regulation? But um, you know what, Lee, I will share this with you. This is not about regulation. Not having power is one thing in a COVID environment where many people are working from home and our utilization of Internet. It, it is a matter of public health and safety. And the fact is they are a virtual monopoly that has a public trust and you have betrayed that public trust and you have to do the utilities have a responsibility it's not about regulation it's about accountability and and maintaining the public trust that we gave you as monopoly so for me i'm very proud to say do your job well okay so that was my flippant response my more serious response is i think that representative farnan may be the person who's got the right idea with this, building on that a little bit, in that I think that the one thing you do is you increase the competition in the industry, you lower the, the, you lower the barriers to entry so that you get more competition. Um, because at the end of the day, 
I really don't care where I get my data from as long as my data comes in at a particular speed and I can continue to watch my Netflix shows. Um, but when the power goes out or when the service goes out rather, that's when I care about the, the, the difference, the, where you can differentiate yourself is in customer service and other things. I also think that I'm not sure for how much longer those kinds of those kinds of providers are going to be monopolistic at the retail level. They'll be monopolistic at the wholesale level, but they're not going to be monopolistic at the retail level as 5G comes into play and other technologies come into play. One of the things that, that Representative Farnan didn't mention, but is another potential competition source, is distributed antenna systems where you essentially hook up the entire city to wireless, um, where you can just get a wireless signal and the cities are paying for very small antenna boxes that go up everywhere. So those are a couple of things. And then the other thing that, that you could look at is um, whether or not the consumer protection statutes uh, work, but um, there'd be a, you'd have to give a great deal of thought to, yeah, Lee, it, it, it's not about looking at Netflix in this day and age. People have to work and, and they're not going to a Panera Bread or a Starbucks in a COVID environment. This is, this is an essential work component. So it's not about the Netflix, truly. It's, it's about people's ability to do their job and, 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 and to be able to do it in the safety of their home in some cases. So well, I, I, I appreciate some of the insight. And, I definitely look forward to working with Brian and, and facilitating some of those uh, solutions for people. People are beyond frustrated. They're angry. Yeah, right, Chris, and and I'll Brian, go back to your question. Brian, could you mind if I just jump in? I, yeah, it is about sure. equity. It is about access. It's about people being able to, you know, pay their bills and feed their family by going to work. It absolutely is. But you're also, we're also getting a sense of how complex all these regulations are and, you know, lead to your point. I, had had a conversation again with the peer attorney about some of the state laws that we had passed and then how the some of the new federal rulings had impacted those you know the competition it, it has to be to your point a business has to be willing to invest and think that they're going to be able to get return on that investment to come here so we definitely need to but i think to tony's point the management of expectations because whether or not we can regulate or, or whatever that framework is the communication and management of expectations, there were people who were told one thing and then were left for, for so long. And I go back, I'll step back again, we've gotta go back to some of the root causes. I mean, I have a college roommate in Iowa. They don't have a lot of trees in Iowa uh, compared to what we have. And they are sitting without power in parts of Iowa right now because the extreme weather conditions have impacted them. So, you know, I'll, I'll just go back Lee, to what you said in the beginning you know, the uh, reliability versus green versus cost. I think we have to look at the total cost, not just of an event. We've got to look at the response. We've got to look at that. But when you look at total cost of energy and, you know, we have some of the worst asthma rates in the nation and some of the issues we've had with um, some of the storms, you know, coastal issues, we, we have to be looking at these regulatory structures at what we can do for consumer service, at what we can do for competition, but we also have to look back at what are we doing to help prevent some of this in the first place. Well, well Kristen, to your point, I think when Kevin Delgado was around, as a very good guy, I think one thing that was more of an issue then was, like, for example, the reliability with clean energy was more of an issue. I think the holy grail here is battery storage, and if those prices come down, that will hopefully be able to check off a reliability and a clean uh, check mark. So um, hopefully more to come on, on that. Here's a question I know we've all received. Um, would we consider moving power lines underground or should the state consider moving power? I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off to you, Lee, but I think that's a classic example of like, sure. But if you think your rate, if you think your bill's higher now, wait till you see it after all those lines go underneath. But, but I'll, let, I'll turn it over to you. So, so we have great experience with putting power lines underground. So um, the, the, the Middletown to, to, Nor to Stanford power line was a huge transmission line, one of the big 345 kilovolt lines on the big metal frames. We're not talking about a power line on a, on a wooden pole. We're talking about the big things. And 
we undergrounded that whole thing. If you lived in Darien or Weston or any of those uh, down county neighborhoods, they put that cable through through the post road, through Route 1, and they undergrounded it. The catch was that the cost of that, it's about a million dollars a mile to run a cable of that size. Um, it's about a million dollars a mile, rule of thumb. It's about three million a mile to put it underground. So you triple the cost. Um, so that's what you have to, that's what you have to look at, number one. And number two, what UI in particular will tell you is that uh, because UI has more of the coast than Eversource does, and particularly a lot of their infrastructure is very near Long Island Sound, they will tell you that one of their concerns is if you underground the lines that are very, very close to Long Island Sound, their concern is, is that seawater gets in there during a storm surge and that obviously salt water and electricity don't mix. Um, so there are technical issues associated with it, but the last time we looked at it is 10 years ago, and certainly um, there have been great strides made in technology, and so it's worth at least looking at again. It's not, in my opinion, it's not an automatic yes or an automatic no, but I do think we need to look at where it makes sense. It certainly makes sense um, for some of the more backbone issues and where we know that, that the poles are at risk. That makes sense. Um, next question is, how can we, uh, what can we do to see more transparency in the rates and how they're generated? Um, I'll defer to you on this one, Leah. I mean, to me, I think a lot of that information is there. It's just not in a way, and it's set forth in a way that I think a reasonably intelligent person would be able to figure it out, but I'll, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, I, I honestly think that, that the best way to see how rates are generated is coffee, because it's really a matter of staying awake as much as anything. It's but, but the rates are generated, it's very dense cost accounting, it's very, very tricky. Um, and I will submit to you that, that a shout out to the Office of Consumer Counsel. We not only have an Attorney General's office that, that looks at these rates, but we also have a dedicated Office of Consumer Counsel that also looks at these rates. And if you want to figure out where the problems are with how the rates are being calculated, you look at what the Office of Consumer Counsel is touting in its briefs, because that's a pretty clear lay people's way of figuring out where the rates are too high or why the rates are too high, et cetera, et cetera. And really the utilities and the Office of Consumer Counsel fight with one another very publicly, as you point out, but that's where you could get some of the transparency because they cut through the accounting um, information, but, but you need an accounting degree to really understand it. And can I just add, Lee, I'm really glad you brought up the Office of the Consumer Council because um, our constituents can reach out directly to them as well and connect with them through us, through, you know, Laura, Brian, Tony, and I as well, but that's another good resource. Yep, agreed. Uh, another question here is, uh, can you see my, I'm like struggling here, I'm like, ah! Because uh, we have so many questions, but that's great. I'm glad we have, well, it's not great because people are struggling with poor service, but um, what is considered the responsibility of the utility, the state, or the town when it comes to branches and limbs that are hanging quite low and close to the tops of some of the many trucks passing by and come close to cables coming from said poles above? Which authority is best to notify of this issue? I would think it would be the tree warden with the town, but uh, or, I mean, you can start there and then they could potentially go off and reach out to UI, but uh, or you can go directly to UI, but that would be my the way I would handle it, but others? It really, are you opening it up to us, Brian? All of us? Sure, if, if right. someone has an answer, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I would, if you... I would say that in, in some cases it's DOT. So for example, if it's a state road on a state right of way, but obviously when, it's, when there are wires involved, the utility company if you're contacting the tree warden, they're going to be contacting the utility company specifically. You know, we've we've had a lot of conversation about how we do tree trimming, and um, I know that's come up again. You know, part of what is important is the way the trees are trimmed in order to be able to save the tree. So um, we've had some dispute in terms of do we just take down the trees or do we um, trim them appropriately? And I think again, going back to the root cause issue. 
we've, we have to be cognizant of the fact that taking down trees in some cases can actually be counterproductive to where we're trying to get. So it's really making sure that that trimming is done responsibly and appropriately. But the tree warden in Fairfield is a tremendous resource and we're incredibly lucky to have someone who's so well versed and, and is in great communication with both UI and DOT. Right. Yeah, and, and, and but, oh, go ahead, Lee. No, uh, what I wanted to follow up is the, the tree clearing is one of the programs that you made the suggestions to, and we've had some conversations about it. But one of the things that I've noticed being out on the road is with down poles, you know, most people don't realize either it's a UI pole or a Frontier or SNET pole, and, and the challenge is. For many of these poles, there are multiple lines, yeah. cable, you know, a telephone, and, and then power. If you ever study as I have is the, the tiering of it, but nevertheless, when poles get replaced, it doesn't seem like they talk to each other. You know, mm -hmm. UI replaces a pole that, that's been down, brand new. They leave the broken down existing pole, and then you got cable boxes that are still on the broken pole. You think UI would let Optimum know that the pole's been replaced, you gotta come and with a bucket truck to line up the cable lines and, and Frontier as well. So I, I think one of the biggest frustrations is the utilities don't talk to each other. So you've got lag time and I think it goes back to, you know, it's 2020. Technology's there for them to communicate. And, and one of the biggest frustrations is now you have pockets of, of homes that, that don't have service and they call after waiting four hours and they say, you have power. We have the whole sector lined up. There's a lack of communications. There's a lack of effort to really do the little extras to benefit the consumer that's not calling you because they have four hours to waste. So I think one of the biggest points is beyond the wires is the utilities themselves don't talk to each other and that underlies the frustration and the further delay have you seen that as yeah, well that, yes i have and and frankly sometimes the utilities don't even know who owns which pole it's it's that it's that basic um the other thing that, though, that is actually one of the questions we got too and i think this is something that definitely should be coming up during uh the public hearings that we have uh in October, and this has to be raised. Can I just can I just put a plug in for some statewide resources for GIS mapping, which is a project I'm working on. Um, but GIS mapping of those poles and ownership would actually help with that. Um, yeah. I know, you know, Lee's nodding, but but truthfully, working with a group and and trying to get some of the utilities on board to be involved with some of our state agencies so that we can do things like that, many other utilities, not in the power sense, yep. but many other uses for that. GIS mapping is important, but here's a simple one. People can go down the street, identify the pole. Lee, you know this, and I want the audience to know, every single pole has an identifier. It's either UI or SNET, and it has a pole number. So for anybody who's looking for power restoration and a down pole, they can help themselves by identifying the pole. You know, 8832 UI pole, that helps the liaison identify where the target area. So every single pole has an identifier. And so for people that are struggling to get power restored or frustrations, who owns the pole, they can do their own due diligence and not wait for others. Every single poll has an identifier. So for people that may be curious right now, you can go take a look. Every single poll has an identifier and they should know that. Yep. The other, right. the, before, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Lee. before we leave this issue, one other thing though to bear in mind is the utilities do the tree trimming and when they do it on wires that are on private property, they'll send you a notice saying, we wanna trim your trees they need permission to trim those trees because they're on private property and frequently homeowners tell them no. Now, if a homeowner tells them no and the tree comes down or the branch comes down, theoretically that homeowner's liable for that down, for that down power line. But, and if the, if the utility does it, then 
then the homeowner's not liable. But just bear in mind that we do have people that are saying no to tree trimming. So some of those overhanging branches you see is because somebody didn't want their tree cut. It's that simple. And I know the town has a renewed commitment that the first select woman included in one of her recent communications. And our forestry committee has done a great job um, because one of the, of also partnering with UI and helping to educate homeowners. Because one of the things that we did see with UI with tree trimming, and I don't remember if it was in Orange or Milford, was an extraordinary aggressive clear cutting. And so I think there's a middle road where we don't clear cut there is definite uh, clearance provided uh, for the lines. And Lee, you're right. I mean, homeowners can, can say no, but hopefully if they're trimmed properly, um, they would be willing to you know, have that taken care of. So, so another question we got here, has the town put, and, and obviously Brenda can't be here, uh, but we could follow up with her on this one. Has the town put a call for RFP, a request for providers, from internet providers to install an alternate internet service for Fairfield? I think that's a great question. I know Fairfield and a lot of town, towns have been involved in something called Solarize, where the town would be a partner in finding um, a partner solar company, where it's basically they would co-promote. And if you did an RFP to internet service providers and said, um, if you win this RFP, we're gonna do our best to co-promote uh, your development of installations in in town and i think something like that would would really be a, a real great idea i don't know if an inter, a new internet service provider would come in uh for the entire town but that's i think one of the questions that's what we would probably want to gauge them on during that rfp to see if they would so um that we can take that as a homework assignment to, to look into that um another one has the town evaluated micro trenching and as a reason conduit is not being added at the same time as the road is open for natural lines that are upgrade. I think the same issue that the um, utilities need to be talking to each other. So with that, it's 111. I could try to hit some of these questions real quickly, uh, but I want to be respectful at times. I know uh, some of our people had a hard stop at 115, so I do want to be mindful of that. But let's just, I'm going to try to jump into some of these questions real quick that we've gotten during uh, this meeting. Um, what about forcing all new developments to be underground? I, feel free anyone to jump in, but I would think that that could make sense. I think doing it for existing poles, it would be cost prohibitive, but for new developments, uh, doing having them go underground would, would make a lot of sense. At the state level, what can we do to eliminate hurdles and cost to prevent competition? We already kind of talked about that. Um, there was one other question that we got here about how do we shorten the time when it gets to get solar projects up and running. Um, I think that there's a lot of work on that level at the state level to um, shorten that by uh, right now you got 169 towns with 169 processes. Um, some things need to be submitted electronically, some things have to be done by paper. Having some more consistency in approach uh, would be helpful. Um, let me see if I can just jump into some of these other questions that we got here. Uh, Tony, regarding your comment regarding Easton, what happens uh, if this happens during the school year? Each internet outage day is out of each outage day is a day out of school, um, and I think that gets to everyone's point on this call is that that's why we need to have sticks. We need to have carrots and sticks because this is a fundamental issue. Um, Brian, I, I thank you for pointing that out. And, and I, I just want to couch this by saying the power outage and the experience we had is, is challenging in itself. We're in a COVID pandemic and, and there has to be a, a, a tremendous sense of urgency and, and responsiveness. And I just don't see it. And even under normal circumstances, you've got to hustle. You've got to be responsive. Um, and, and, and nobody can be perfect but show the humility to understand that you will try to do better. But the fact is we're having these kind of challenges in a COVID pandemic, multiply that. It, it's the inconvenience multiplied by many. Uh, and, and that's something that the utilities seem to be tone deaf to is people are living in a COVID environment. They don't have the power. They don't have internet. It's not an issue of inconvenience. 
It's an issue of public health and safety. Yeah. And um, very, very well said, Tony. Um, lastly, because I know it's 115, there's a couple questions regarding for the town. Uh, one related to, is there a list of fiber, fiber optic providers uh, that have a presence in Fairfield, retail, business, government? Um, and then is that list available? Let's, let me work with, uh, after this call, maybe I can work with uh, Brenda's office and Jackie, her chief of staff, to see if we can get something online with the list of those providers. And at the same time, raise this issue of whether or not an RFP would be a good approach um, as some of these internet search providers are reaching out about coming into um, Fairfield. Let's do it in a way that compares them all so we have apples and apples. So with that, um, thank you all for joining. Any final parting words, if you, they can be said in less than 10 seconds, and then uh, um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for doing this, Brian. You. And yeah, thank you, Lee. You are a font of knowledge and information. Thanks thank so you, Lee. Thank you, thank Lee. You. I appreciate it greatly. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys.